I am Luke Lindenbringer. I come from central Missouri. Uh, we came, I moved back to the family farm. My grandfather retired when I got out of college and we were very slow adopting very conventional farmers. And we stayed that way for about 10 years until there was a land shakeup when my grandfather passed away. And on a reduced land base and conventional agriculture saying get big or get out, and I didn't like those options, I chose option C, which wasn't really available, so I, d I designed it myself. Um, so dad, gave me free reign to do whatever I wanted. I jumped off the cliff. He said, are you sure about that? I said, don't worry, I'll, the parachute will come somewhere along the way. <laughs> We've been on an adventure ever since. Um, my topic I'm talking about this morning is called maximizing solar collection. All you really need to remember is diversity is good, because um, we'll go on some tangents and some different ways. Um, when Gabe called me this winter and asked me to speak. I thought it sounded like a really good idea. A week ago, it didn't sound nearly as appetizing, honestly. So we raise beef. We just expanded the hen operation. We got around 150 cows. We feed all those calves out. We just added 2,000 hens as an Elaine operation to follow the cows. Row crop about 450 acres of annual crops, corn, soy, wheat and some other specialty crops, depending on market timing. The other year I was ready to get out of annual crops entirely, and then I heard Gabe Brown and Ray Archuleta talk about soil health and getting off the rat race that is conventional agriculture, and I decided to try some biological methods, and so we've been slowly migrating that way. Started grazing annuals after I ran out of feed in the feedlot system and was sort of weeks away from actually having forage and so I started grazing corn. That developed into grazing mixes and moving on from there. So at home I have four dogs and my first dog is really just a pet but he's called my working stock dog. He's a miniature Australian Shepherd and he rides with me on my gator all the time. And honestly he's the devil. Okay, he goes to my other dogs and sits on their shoulder and he's the bad angel that sits over here and says, hey guys, there's this great smell ray over here. You don't need to watch chickens. And he's not around to even watch you. So it's no big deal, just come over here. And eventually they follow him and he gets them in trouble. And then he sits there and looks cute and is like, I don't know what happened, they just followed me. It wasn't my fault. And he's just really excited and he really runs around and he's just, and he has a theme song and it goes, I'm so excited. I just can't hide it. I'm about to lose control and I think I like it. Uh-huh. <laughs> Which is sort of in contrast to my oldest chicken dog who's extremely regal. And he likes to sit calmly for days at a time and watch chickens. Maybe not by choice, but the chain keeps in there, so he sits regally and watches chickens. The chickens may be slightly beneath his dignity, but that's what he's paid to do, and that's what he does. His theme song's a little different, and he's like, I'm so excited. I just can't hide it. I'm about to lose control, and I think I like it. Uh-huh. So my third dog is a, another Pyrenees cross who I got as a chicken dog, and he's about eight months old. So he's got a little bit more energy. And when the devil comes and says there's a great smell, he's like, awesome. These were boring. I'm going to run with you. And he's uh, all over the place, and he's just excited. He, he doesn't eat chickens anymore. That's a really <laughs> shock collars work for that. Um, and the old dog convinced him that that was not the best option he had. So, um, but he gets really, 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 really excited. But he has a sort of a short-term focus, so Chain keeps him also watching chickens. But his theme song is more like this. I'm so excited. What were we doing? <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, I'm so excited. Oh, look, there's a shiny object over there. Let's go over there. Oh, great smell. Yeah, 
and he just ends up all over the place. Ah, I'm so excited. Ah, I just can't hide it. I'm about to lose control. And I think I like it. Uh -huh. And then we have the last dog, who was my brother's dog. He's a Pyrenees cross, and he's been a pet for a long time. But I needed another dog to watch chickens, and so I recruited him. Much, he didn't really appreciate the recruitment. He liked his lazy life of laying around the house, and now he gets to lay around the chicken house. But that's beside the point. But he's a whiner. He weighs 120 pounds, but he's a whiner. So his theme song's more like this. I'm so excited. I don't want to sing by myself. Can you sing with me? I'm so excited. I just can't hide it. This is so hard. I can't, yeah, he just goes on. He just whines all the time. So really the only point of that story was that I'm a prodigious noticer, and I see things that other people seem to not be able to see. And I don't know why that is. I don't know if it, I see things because I'm looking for them, or I'm looking for things and so then I see them. But either way, I don't know whether it's the chicken or the egg. I'm not sure which one. At our farm, it's the chicken. We bought chickens and eggs are coming later. But on this question, I'm not sure which came first. I'm not solving that mystery over time either. I just my farm had chickens first. So I'm a prodigious noticer. I th see things that it seems like no one else can see. So how many people have seen a dog chasing a rabbit? I have dogs. They chase rabbits all the time. So you see the dog chasing a rabbit. And the dog jumps over the wood pile, around the barbecue grill, underneath the car, just, just all over the place, just chasing this rabbit. And you're like, that dog is crazy. I don't know what's wrong with it, but it clearly, you know, that rabbit over there, it's going to go get it. Never going to catch it, but it's going to go get it. Okay, in that situation, take the rabbit away. The dog, pile, dog jumps over the wood pile, around the barbecue grill, underneath the car, just, and you're like, what is wrong with that dog? And my neighbors look at me and like, what is wrong with that guy? I just see the rabbit, which is maximizing solar collection on my farm, that they can't see. The rabbit's there. The rabbit of maximizing solar collection on my farm is there. Will I ever achieve total solar collection? No, I won't. But if I add enough diversity, I can maximize solar collection on my farm and catch the rabbit that no one else in my community seems to even know exists. And I appreciate coming here because there are other rabbit chasers around. <laughs> and so we can sit and talk about our war stories. So diversity is good. Just remember that. On your tables, you'll find some paper. There's some blue paper, some red paper, and some yellow paper. Um, this is for some interaction with the crowd. If you're a doodler, it gave you something to doodle on. If you're a sleeper, you can sort of wad them up and you're their head on them. But we're going to try a little origami with them, so just bear with me and I'll get to them as we move through. Um, but anybody who wants to play along when I do this, um, it's supposed to make a point. So just uh, we'll get there. But I just wanted to let you know that on your pay, pay tables, everyone does have paper that there should be enough for everybody to, to play with. Um, so yeah. So maximizing solar collection. Let's get into an actual talk here now that we've sort of worked through the beginning. So how much energy are we talking about? How many people were here last year? OK, not very many. Great, because you heard Russ, and he explained this in science terms, and I don't understand it, blah, blah, blah. It goes on, yeah. But it's about 2 kilowatt hours per meter squared per day. So on this chart here, you can see on the axis, on this axis, which is Y, uh, somebody, yeah, correct me, Y over here, you have kilowatt hours per meter squared, and on the bottom you have time, and each one of these charts is for different latitudes um, and how much energy, and here's two, and it's all, they all basically run in this two range, about two kilowatt hours per meter squared. Does that mean really anything? I'm not sure it does, but it, uh, it just lets you know there's a lot of energy being dropped on our farm every day. And so our goal should be, like, how are we going to collect as much solar energy? And as, as a professional solar collector, it's my job to collect energy and sell those products. That's what farmers do. We collect energy, self, produce sellable products. So I'm trying to figure out how I can collect the most solar energy so I can sell the most products. 
and I have quite a bit to work with, more than I can ever use. And so my goals range from how can I collect the most, how can I export a sustainable amount, how can I affect the food system, these are goals that I have, how can I affect the food system, and will future generations thank me for my efforts in this endeavor? So moving forward, the first thing is how do we prevent energy spills? If you read much into solar energy collection, they like to have this little joke that an energy spill for them is just a really nice day. But in, in agriculture, we have energy spills all the time. They don't look like this. Maybe they're, they're usually not this gruesome. This is a really sad environmental tragedy as well. But I think that we can have the environmental tragedy of solar waste can be not maybe as equally as detrimental in one moment, but over time it can add up. So what do energy spills look like in our business? And I would contend that these are major energy spills. On perennial ground, or on annual ground, sorry, you have tillage or in the springtime here where you have burn down and there's nothing green growing on that ground. Solar energy is being wasted, it's being spilled. You can see in the background of both of these pictures, the trees are green, the grass is green. There's solar collection being made in this environment, but it's being wasted on this property. And it has all kinds of extra uh, negative effects include increased temperature and burning of organic matter and different things like oxidation of organic matter and different things like that to put CO2 back in the air. But I would also contend, since we're more of a grass-based system here, that these would also contend as major energy spills. The amount of bare soil, I don't know if you all can see this, but in, if you look closer in a picture like on a computer, the amount of bare soil that is visible through this continuously grazed pasture, extremely short, has very little photosynthetic capacity. The, the blades, which are your solar panels, are just not very big here, can't do anything. And in the bottom, this picture could be in winter when this is a dormant time, but if you don't remove this grass layer here, you won't be able to start new grass next spring or, or during this time, and you will have effectively wasted the energy. This energy here, if it's not consumed by animals, will be oxidized slowly over time. So my first thought is, please let me never have something that looks like any of the pictures I just showed. If, if I can do that, if I can just stop the spills, I've already increased my energy con my energy consumption or my energy use considerably over anybody else around. And that's the first step. So let's start talking about how we're going to use the energy. So the first, most common probably, is just a perennial monocultured pasture. And everyone thinks of it as their low cost solar panel. It doesn't cost us much to put in, we just kind of put cows on it, it's, it grows grass, cows graze it, it's sort of a closed cycle. Now, if everyone looks at their yellow sheet of paper that's sitting in front of them, if you lay that flat out in front of you, this is your monocultured perennial pasture laying on the ground. It's extremely efficient at collecting energy on a very specific time, when the light is shining directly down on it, when all the conditions are right. If you move the light source to one side or at a different angle, it just does not collect energy as efficiently. The same with this solar panel here. It only collects energy when the water conditions are right, the sun's at the right angle, You've just limited yourself in the amount of solar energy you can collect. And it might be the most efficient on one-fifth of one day out of the year or something like that. But 
overall, it's not going to collect as much solar energy as there are systems out there. So we'll move in. Um, but the question is, is it really low cost? Because um, Jim Malazondo talks about that if you've got a low yield perennial pasture, it's actually your highest cost feed source because the opportunity cost for that field is so much. And it's got a really low solar collection, so that creates the low yield, which creates the high cost. So I, I would contend that it's not really even low cost, but it is, but it is just the easiest least management intensive way. You're going to take management to increase your solar collection, um, your solar collection availability. So diversity is good. It's pretty simple. Everyone, if you take your piece of yellow paper and you just sort of wad it up a little bit into a, into a ball and then smash it all flat back out in front of you again, we just added a lot of diversity to this very smooth surface here. So if we just smooth it back out and we just let it sit there. Now, if the light is at a different angle, it's still going to collect energy. If we, you know, you've got all these different angles that are different heights and different, it's just going to collect energy. So in our, in our perennial pastures, when you add diversity, you, you just increase the amount of solar collection you can collect. You have different leaf structures. You have forbs that are tall and they have long, flat leaves versus your grasses that are closer to the ground and their um, linear leaf structure that's laying. You add broad leaves of other sorts, uh, clovers. They have wide, flat leaves that can catch energy at a different angle and a different wavelength than your, than your grasses do. You have different layers. So you have your taller forbs and your shorter grasses and your even shorter legumes or you have you just have different layers that energy can get caught on at different angles, so you're more efficient over the whole season. Different orientations, they grow at different times of the year. Um, your early cool season grasses are going to grow extremely early in the season. When there's a lot cooler, you're going to have your warm seasons come on later that will provide your, your C4s that are going to collect energy during the the long days of the summer and are much more efficient at that time of year. You're going to have, if you can collect energy more efficiently at more different times of the year, you're going to increase your overall biomass and your overall solar collection capacity. Um, they're all going to flower at different times and all these things have multiple other benefits for either pollinators or carbon collection or, or uh, oxygen production or CO2 removal. or so. Diversity is good, and more diversity is more solar collection. Now, if you move into our annual crop ground, mostly I'm in corn and soybean country. It seems to be a theme. A lot of us are, are in the middle of corn and soybean country, and I'm on pretty flat ground, so everything around me is, is in corn and soy. And corn and soy do collect energy during the hottest days of the year with the most growing degree days in each day. So they have the most solar collecting time and they do an amazing job of collecting that solar energy. But I would still contend that as monocultures they're leaving a lot on the table plus they're only collecting energy three, four months out of the year at the most. Um, so they're leaving a lot of solar energy, they're leaving a lot of time when the sun is shining that they're not collecting energy that you're moving backwards. If you're not moving forward in this system, I really feel like you are moving backwards. So unfortunately, whatever percentage of the farm country is covered in this sort of system is, is, is moving backwards. So if we move into diversity in the summer, you start planting diverse mixes um, in, with different marketing options. Uh, the bottom picture there is a sorghum sedan, sun hemp, cow pea, soybean, corn, tillage radish mix. Um, as you can see, there are lots of different leaf structures. There's lots of different heights. There's, there's the low growing plants that are on the ground. Um, there's tall plants. There's 
broad leaves, there's different shaped leaves, and all those will collect light at a different energy level and a different time of the day to create the most efficiency. The top picture is corn with cow peas growing. Um, those cow peas were about six feet tall and then vined up through the 12 foot corn. Um, both of these were grazed out. Grazing adds a lot of options in your annual crop ground for providing, for providing <coughs> But there are definitely innovators who are adding more diversity even into their standard corn soy rotation. Um, the easiest way, of course, is first would be in the cool season just adding a cover crop. And this isn't a cover crop meeting, so we don't go really into that, but all this can be grazed and or harvested in different ways. At the bottom here, we have rye with hairy vetch growing in it. Um, there's a little wheat here on this edge as well. Um, and that was actually taken to seed and harvested as a seed for the hairy veg. In the upper right, yep, it's right for everybody, including me, um, is wheat with crimson clover and turnips that actually made it through the winter. And that was once again grazed out in the spring uh, for termination. But both of these are collecting energy. Anytime the sun was shining during the winter, they were picking up extra energy days. They were putting that energy into the soil through their natural sugars, through photosynthesis. So on annual ground, we have this opportunity to, to really expand how much solar energy just by collecting through the winter months. And with cattle, we have a really efficient way of harvesting those extra months including the cash crop through cattle and through livestock. Um, and depending on how much headage you're willing to allow in your grass-fed business, you can take this down a lot sooner. This, this rye was probably way too far along to anything want to graze it, but they would trample it for the hairy veg. So if you go to any soil health thing, you get into the four types of plants. You have the warm season grasses, the warm season broad leaves, the cool season grasses, and the cool season broad leaves. I'm not sure how many events I've been to that I've heard that at. I'm not really trying to beat it, but if you have those, each one of those every year, you increase your energy production, increase your energy potential. And that's, so the more energy we can collect and the more energy we can harvest, the more energy we can sell. So let's compare C3 to C4 plants just a little bit um, because they have differences and depending on where you are in the country or in the world, you vary how much of each one of these you kind of need. The reason C3s are less efficient in the summer is because their maximum solar and they're mo so on this axis over here, we have synthetic CO2 assimilation, which correlates to solar collection. And down here, we have leaf temperature. So cool seasons here in this 20 to 25 degree Celsius range is their optimal work. Clearly, your warm seasons are much further over here. And part of that is their, the design of the plant themselves. When cool seasons get hot, they shut their stomatas so that they don't lose water. That raises the CO2 concentration inside and they become really inefficient. Where the C4s, which actually have four carbons in their, in their chain. So your C4s are your warm seasons, your sorghum sedan, your corn, your native warm seasons are all your C4 plants. And your C3s are your cool seasons like fescue, brome, timothy. Um, so the C4s have a regulating mechanism so that they can keep their CO2 concentration correct and keep photosynthesizing at a much warmer temperature. So they're more efficient in the hot. And depending on where you are in the country, depends on really how much percentage of each one of these C3 versus C4 you want to have in your rotation. So as you move north, Having more C3 grasses in your rotation makes much more sense because you have less C4 efficient time. Whereas if you move south, I'm here right at 40 degrees latitude. This is latitude across the bottom, moving from 25 to 
60, and I'm right here at 39 in Columbia, Missouri. And over here is the relative carbon gain. So right here at 40, if you follow, follow this chart up, basically it's saying I need me more C4s than C3s, but probably like a 55% C4 mix versus a 45% C3 mix. And everybody can kind of go on that chart from where you are and determine the percentage of each one of those you might need to have in your mix to maximize your solar collection based on your general climate and your latitude. But we're not just in the grass business and we're not just in the, um, we're not, we're in the ecosystem development business. And so I'm going to challenge everyone here to think beyond the grasses um, when we're starting to think about maximizing solar collection. And it can get really exciting and get really far out when you start moving into this realm, but I'm just asking to move from grasslands into savannas with your grasses with your open tree canopy, which is what savannas are. A lot of, a lot of, a lot of the most productive environments, the most mammalian pounds come off of savannas because they have lots and lots, the most leaf surface really of any ecosystem or biome in the world. This is in Africa, clearly the uh, uh, savannas over there with uh, wildebeest, but we can move into savannas in this area as well. They're just going to look a little different, have different species. So if you're grazing in a savanna ecosystem, it's generally called silvopasturing, and there are numerous, numerous benefits to silvopasturing um, listed here. You have shade, so you have, when it's hot in the summer, you give your cattle, um, they can lower their temperature by being in the shade and not have the solar radiation baking on them. Fodder, <clears throat> you have leaves off of trees. When I move my cows into a new pasture, the trees are the first thing they hit. They're tree leaves that they can catch because they're going to be the most energy dense part of the plant and the most nutrient dense part of the plant that they can, most nutrient dense forage that they can find. The microclimate it deals with more of a winter that it holds the latent heat off in the summer and the latent warm air down in the winter and so your cows are more comfortable underneath underneath your or sheep or pigs or whatever you might be grazing. I know my chickens love trees. They just spend their days in the trees that I that I have. Recycling of nutrients um, has deals both with the trees pulling the nutrients out of the ground as well as the cows will graze. If you have scattered shade, we'll move around the pasture and we'll more evenly graze the there. The reducing the evapotranspiration of the grasses. So grasses can't really deal with full sun anyway. They're not efficient enough to deal with 100% sun. So really about 50% shade is what grasses optimize in. Um, I've got some research on here we'll talk about here in a second, but reducing the evapotranspiration, so reducing the transpiration out of the grasses below them um, has, a major, has a major benefit. Drought reserve, there's a lot of people who can cut the tree limbs off and let the animals eat that. Nitrogen fixing, depending on your tree. And then wind breaks so that you can sort of climate mitigate in your, um, in your area, in pasture utilization. And all these won't be necessary benefits in every environment, but different ones will be in a benefit in different environments, depending on where you're at. So moving into some research, there was, I looked at these studies, cumulative forage production, forage quality, and livestock performance from an annual ryegrass and a cereal rye mixture in a pine walnut silvopasture. They get paid by the word at the university, I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry to the university people here, I apologize. <laughs> I'm right next to University of Missouri Columbia, and I lovingly refer to it as Monsanto University on a regular basis. They have the Monsanto Center and the Monsanto Hall, and the 
there's some good people that work there, including Dr. Colin Bach, who did this study back in 2006. And then also there's the forage quality response from C3 and C4 perennial grasses to shade. Um, so basically in those research, um, Dr. Colin Bach in the top one there, he, he went into an established civil, or he went into an established forest at the agroforestry center that we have at Mizzou and decided to do this innovative research with trees and went in and spread, uh, spread this forage as well as spreading it out on open pasture and then compared the gains over multiple years and as well as forage production, I mean clearly what the title says there. So what he found was that, or in the other research as well, found that grasses can't full, utilize the full sun. Generally, the herbage quantity was less under the trees or in the tree system. But the nutrient levels increased so that in the end, the cattle performance was not statistically different. That there was no difference between the amount of pounds that they could grow in a shaded environment versus out of the shaded environment with total canopy spread. So in the trees, they received, they grew 20% less forage, but they planted 24% less ground because they stayed away from the trees on each side to plant it. So they planted 24% less seed and grew 20% less forage. Um, and then the cattle, but the cattle over the same area gained the same amount of weight which was pretty significant. So trees don't necessarily, I know in my area, if you have cattle, the people who have cattle think that trees are a bad thing. And like most issues, whether a tree is a good situation in a pasture or a bad situation deals with the management of the pasture and not the tree itself. Nature isn't the problem generally. We, we tend to be the problem uh, that goes along with that. So you also have this integrating silvopasture into current forage livestock systems, which was also by Colin Bach in like 2009. And he did an open pasture versus a pasture that was open, but 25% of it was in this silvopasture area, different silvopasture area. So the cows that were in the silvopasture lost 10% less weight over the winter due to the microclimate conditions that the trees provided. They kept the heat there so the cows didn't struggle as much through the winter. They had more, they had more uh, <clears throat> wind blockage. And granted, this was only 25% of the land that was in that part was in trees. The rest of it was open, just like, your, just like the other side. So they only went into that 25% during the worst of the worst and it gained 10% weight loss over the winter. Um, and they had 12% less calving difficulty, which is significant, but I'm, unfortunately, they're innovative, but I'm sure they were calving in February or January or something like that. So they were calving in open in January versus calving in the silvo pasture in January. It's not really a great comparison, but 12% less calving. And then the big number I felt like was 55, per, 55 pounds per head heavier at weaning weight in the silvo pasture. By mitigating just those few days in the winter that got really bad and those few days in the summer when it got really hot, they were gaining 55 pounds, which at today's price is a significant amount. Plus they were growing the trees, which will have long-term benefits of both um, they're growing for wood production, for, for logging. So on my farm, I made a mistake, which is called an innovation, in case you didn't know. <laughs> and this, we had this pasture that grew up in sprouts. It just sort of, all of a sudden, we didn't brush hog it for a couple of years because I refused to run the brush hog. So it grew up in sprouts, and, and everyone's like, what are you going to do with those? I was like, oh, it's two-story grazing. I mean, what, what else is it, you know? I mean, it's, it's two-story grazing. So when I move my cows in, they will graze most of these leaves 
especially when the trees were smaller. They're getting a little big now. And then the grass underneath. And it varies naturally in the density of the trees. So I've got some that's got 25% trees up to some that's 100% trees. So it's a pretty decent mix and I can look at what actually works really well. It was a really good experiment for being a mistake. I mean, it turned out really, really well. The neighbors are still really nervous for me. Please pray. I'm, I'm, I'm going to be saved one of these days. But it hasn't been mowed yet. <laughs> but after they got done grazing it, then it would look something like that. And unfortunately, they mucked it up. But it was 2015, and we had about 25 inches, too many inches rain this spring and summer. So, But you can see how much of the tree canopy that they actually grazed out. And from what I can tell, I haven't had the cows kill very many trees yet. Goats can work on the trees by eating the bark off, but cows generally take out very few of the trees and they were grazing up as high as they could, pushing some of the trees over and grazing all the leaves. Doesn't seem to have affected the trees. They sprout the leaves back out just like the grass and grow on. Long rest period, um, of course. So I'm not the only one who's tried this, in fact, I stole the idea. Most of the innovations I try, I just stole from someone else. I just tried them on my own place and people had never seen them before. But Jim Elizondo did this down in Mexico and these are, these are a legume producing tree. He was using them for dairy cows and using the trees as actual forage. So he, used the, he actually used the brush hog to keep the trees in this sort of really low vegetative state where they could graze the whole thing. And he said that it is the most productive silvopasture you can have is one that is edible by the animals that you're utilizing. His results came out that, there it is, he planted this jumbe in the Bermuda grass pasture. He was getting over two pounds a day gain with an average of three steers per acre on this system or increased milk production by 40%. Um, he had the spacing on five and a half foot centers of this nitrogen producing if someone can say the Latin name, by all means, yell it out. Um, that word up there, that tree, um, and the Bermuda grass. And so within a few years, the, the roots of the tree filled in all the way underneath the Bermuda grass and provided up to 300 pounds of nitrogen per acre. So he, was, he found that the most productive system, silvopasture, he could definitely find. Also helped by the reduced air temperature by up to 20 degrees and then less irrigation in the system. So silvopasture, either as just as a forage or as just for the shade and, and uh, other mitigating factors that it can provide, um, whether eating the trees or not, can be a productive practice. I feel like basically anywhere. Um, in the drier environments, it gets more complicated, um, but there are trees native to a lot of this world that we don't see anymore. So in addition to that, you have the environmental benefits of the trees themselves. So increased rainfall. So one of the great books that you can read, and I would recommend everyone read it, is called Tree Crops by J. Russell Smith, written in the 20s, I think, and then re-released in like 49 or 50. And he talks that trees can provide 40% of our rainfall through transpiration through the leaves. So 40% of the rainfall that we get in the Midwest comes from transpiration out of tree leaves at some time already. So we really create our own droughts when we, when my neighbors cut down all the trees and bulldoze them so that they can grow more monoculture, we're creating our own droughts because we're reducing the amount of transpiration that actually adds water that creates the rainfall. Um, there was a study done in 92 that was looking at increased surface runoff and how the trees were filtering the water and creating, um, reducing non-source pollutions by up to 80% by just adding a tree line to the filter strip um, at, the edge of, at, at the edge of fields. Soil armor, so back to Soil Health 101, raindrops falling out of the sky have a lot of energy. Um, 
the trees just intercept lots of lots of rain and hold it up in the air. They're pulling nutrients from deep in the soil. This is also out of tree crops, pulling the nutrients from deep in the soil and then depositing them on the top of the soil with their leaves when they drop them. Um, carbon sequestration, the, they figure an average of six or seven trees can take the carbon out of the air that is produced by one car traveling 10,000 miles during the year. Um, so it's something like 48 kilograms or of carbon per tree per year when they, um, as they, through their life cycle. Wildlife habitat, so predator and prey both use trees and tree lines for pollinating the flowers, the crops, the other plants that we have on our farms. It provides nests for the birds that can eat the flies off our livestock. Um, the amount of wildlife that we can add back to an environment by adding trees and giving that other structure for the, those animals to live in and live around it is pretty amazing. In clean air, so trees, according to uh, tree crops, J. Russell Smith, some trees have up to an acre of leaf surface in a single tree. And all of those leaves act like a filter and they clean the air by filtering the dirt and particles out and allowing them to settle around the tree. And the tree, for the tree, it was a natural way to gather nutrients because that, that dust that was in the air was nutrient dense. And when they collected it and it fell down on the ground, then they had nutrient dense soil collection around their, around their bases. So they added a lot of clean air. So an acre of tree leaves out of one tree is pretty amazing, and I think. So this is the origami part of the presentation. And so you're going to take a piece of blue paper. There's a lot of blue trees out there. You just got to go look for them, really. And if you fold the paper in half, it doesn't matter which way. Fold it in half, and then fold it in half again. and set it on top of your other paper, you just created two acres of leaf surface on the same acre of ground. I haven't seen any trees like this either, but it made the origami really simple and I could understand it. So, <laughs> so we just added a second acre of trees, acre of leaves for carbon collection, for solar collection, for CO2 reduction and oxygen production per acre by adding a tree. You can have about six, for civil pasture, the, the perfect number is six basal feet, which is six square feet of trunk surface per acre, whether that's in one tree or six trees that have one foot square trunks. There's a lot of square trunks out there, too. Yeah. All the trees, trees drink up a lot of water, too. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm sure there are. Uh, I don't have that in my head. Um, but there are a lot of, there are getting to be more resources all the time for looking at guilds of trees in, in different areas and those sort of things. So I'm looking for this oak savanna. I really wish this was off my place. It's not, it's just a picture. But with the warm seasons, that's really hard to see up there, isn't it? So the trees and trees overstory, you have this diverse mix of warm seasons, cool seasons, broad leaves on the understory, a really uh, efficient solar collection, a really pretty pastoral picture that we need to get people thinking about that this can be a pretty pastoral picture as opposed to lawns. Um, and efficient in the solar collection side, maximizing our solar collection. So let's move to the forest that's beyond the trees. So that's a, that's a pretty simple step for me, but we're moving, I think further than that, and I'm like, how can I gather sellable products from my trees? So I don't want just trees that provide these 
nominal benefits that I can't gain value from. I'm looking for a system that is going to gain value for, it's going to stack on my farm and gain value for me as well as collect additional energy. So you can have all these, so you can have the, all these different layers of trees and, and this comes from uh, the Woody Perennial Polyculture website um, and it talks about these different layers of trees. In your canopy trees, you're probably talking your oaks or your chestnuts or your beech, usually nut production in that canopy tree. In the medium tree, you're talking about your fruit production, usually apples or pears. Shrubs, you're looking at your hazelnut type varieties. Brambles, in my area, you have gooseberries, raspberries, blackberries, currants. You can also have your grass underneath as well as your grapevines going up your trees. So this is actually New Forest Farm. This is Mark Shepard's place. Another great book is Restoration Agriculture by Mark Shepard. And he talks about moving into replacing food crops with permanent agriculture. So the benefits of WPP, which is Woody Perennial Polycultures, um, is that you add biodiversity. So every time you add a species, it, it allows the network of eight additional species on your, on your property. So if you add one plant, theoretically eight additional bugs, insects, microbiology can then sustain themselves on your, on your, on your area. Mass production. I think this is one of the most exciting options is uh, perhaps raising pigs on mast throughout the entire season. Um, you start with different, you have different polycultures of different fruits that are, or nuts that are harvesting, are being ripened at different times of the year. You can have mass production that drops, and whether that's for human consumption or for the animals, for fat, fattening, um, either way it's a really productive benefit and an easily um, attainable income stream, which leads into income streams of both, both the understory crops and the, and the uh, animals that you might be able to run on them. So one of my goals would be that I have a harvesting crew on my farm. And just a group of people, one, two, however many it takes, that all they do from spring to fall is harvest. There's no maintenance that they do. They just have a different crop that they're harvesting every week of the year throughout the entire growing season. And it's possible in my, my environment at 39 degrees uh, latitude. I'm not sure it's possible everywhere, but if all your workers had to do was just harvest, just harvest, and just harvest, and just harvest, and just harvest, that's just the income stream, just rolling all the time. The cost are not, there's no cost there except for the labor of harvesting. The cost is clearly in an upfront cost, but there's little or no maintenance after establishment, and these systems are very biodiverse, and so they create long-term, low cost, low input cost, long-term gains. So the three keys to wealth in any endeavor are long-term vision, delayed gratification, and the power of compounding. And trees and woody perennial polycultures do all three of those. You have to have a long-term vision that you're going to invest now and it's going to compound over time and produce a long-term return on that investment. And whether that investment return is actually selling berries or if it's selling um, some other some other byproduct, uh, pigs grazing it, or bees that you can then add to the system. Um, it's just a long-term, it's the long-term vision of, of moving to this wealth and abundance that is available and possible. When we start thinking about how can we add more layers of solar collection. Red so we got left. So red, if you take your red and you tear the red into quarters,
and then we wad it up into four little balls and we place them on our acre. We'll add another acre of leaf surface on our one acre of ground. So you can pay, put them, plant them around your trees or wherever you need to have them so that you can collect your, oops, over here. So we just took a single acre and we added two additional acres of leaf surface into our productivity capacity on the farm. So if we can multiply every acre by three, it, that seems like a much cheaper arrangement than trying to acquire more land and move forward. So now I'm moving back to my goals. I gotta begin with the end in mind, as Stephen Covey says in Seven Habits. How can I collect the most solar energy? How can I affect the food system? I wanna affect the food system in a way that it changes how people think about food, how they buy food, where they buy food, the connections of people to food. And I think we're on the cusp of that in the industry and all the other speakers have been talking about it and have led right into my, my talk here. How can I create the most opportunity on my farm? When you think about what Blaine was talking about, stacking enterprises and what I'm talking about, all, there's just so many niches that can be filled in our environment that can collect solar energy and be exported in a different way that don't take away from any other production but add opportunity on our farm. And so if I'm farming 1,250 acres, how many people, how many people can I put on my farm that gain income, that run their own independent businesses on my same acres, that stack their enterprises so that we can fully utilize as much solar energy and sell products in a diversity of ways and provide opportunity for people to get back on the land and, and to really invest. We need more creative minds in the land, not less. So we, we're really trying to push that, push that forward there. And then will future generations thank me? I really am trying to figure out how I can add the most to the soil. If I can add perennial and wood crops, then I can have generational productions. And I'm not working every year to build from scratch, that I'm working generationally. So these are, these are the efforts that I'm, that I'm trying to work towards. So on my farm, um, this, is, this is my home place here. It's 160 acres. Um, you can see my annual crop grazing, which looked a lot like what we saw yesterday at MSU up there, over there, and with the, with the breaks. And then, um, so I really want to go into this relatively flat ground, and, but this is the contour map. Um, those are on five foot, five foot contours. And add in swales and and ponds to collect water, and then along each one of those, go in with a tree system that has an overstory, an understory, and a berry layer. And what I'm thinking of now really is probably pecan, pawpaw, and elderberry, because all of those have a pawpaw not so much an established market, um, a long-term market, and you know available cash flow. And as the pecans, which take 20 years to start producing nuts the elderberries will provide a short-term income and I'm gonna run them in single lines so that I'm really not taking any production out. And if I put them every 150 feet, that's what my lanes were gonna be anyway. So I only gotta add one additional wire and I can add two additional incomes um, to, the, to the property. So the strategy, of course, add biodiversity, which increases solar collection, increases photosynthesis, more plant growth, more carbon collection, then you have biology breakdown, whether that be in the soil or through animals, which is increases soil carbon, water retention, repeat, and just run the biodiversity across. Pump money out the bottom. Pump money out the bottom. Add solar energy, pump money out the bottom. How many have heard the experiment of the, of the four monkeys? Four monkeys experiment, anybody heard that? Okay, so somewhere, I think it was in California, they did an experiment where they put four monkeys in a cage, and above the cage, in the cage, they put a ladder and they hung a banana above it. So one of the monkeys was like, 
banana, and it's like, I'm eating that, and he starts going over. Well, they spray the other three monkeys with water. They realize that I'm getting sprayed with water because that idiot's going to get that banana, and so they go over and bully him and knock him down, beat on him until he decides that he's not going to get the banana. After a little bit, one of the other monkeys is like, maybe that was a fluke. I'll try it for the banana myself. They do the same thing. They beat the, beat the monkey up, and he, nobody, nobody in the cage, nobody in the cage will ever go for the for Thank you. For the banana again. So no one in the cage will get the banana. Okay, so take two of the monkeys out, put two new monkeys in. One of the new monkeys is like, banana! And he's like, so he goes, two of the monkeys that have been sprayed, without getting sprayed at all, will go attack him. The third monkey, never having been sprayed, is like, oh look, that looks like a beat down. It's time to go join in. And he joins in. So The new monkey doesn't get the banana. The other monkey doesn't know why he's beating him up, but he doesn't get the banana either. Take the, old, the last two of the old monkeys out, put two new monkeys in. So now no one in the cage has ever been sprayed with water. One of the new monkeys is like banana. He goes to climb the ladder. The two monkeys that were in the cage before go over, beat him up. The third one joins in. Now as long as you never take all the monkeys out of the cage, no one in the cage will ever get the banana. We're getting taught by monkey thinkers in this world, and all they want to create is this. Because this is what, they've never even smelled or tasted the banana. They've never tasted the banana. They've never even smelled the banana, and they're telling you how to eat the banana. And everything they're telling us to do leads to this. Because how many people think any one of these structures was built in the middle of a desert? I'm sure the Egyptians really decided to drag thousands of tons of stone out in the middle of the desert to build a pyramid. No, they picked the most productive, the most productive environments that they could find and built their civilizations there, built these huge structures, and then pro proceeded to create deserts. And we're doing this on a global scale now through annual agriculture, exactly the same way. Read Dirt, The End of Civilization, it's a great book. It'll make you, keep you up at night. But every one of these were built in the most productive environments they could find, and then they proceeded to create deserts. So I'm here to applaud everyone who's here today, because you came here to learn from banana eaters who have actually tasted a banana. <laughs> when they teach you, they actually know what a banana tastes like. And so when they tell you to do something, it's because they know. So I come here for the same thing, to rub shoulders and to rub elbows with banana eaters. So I just really appreciate everyone being here. This is what we're trying to avoid. And this is the group that can avoid it. Maximizing solar pr production just is a little bonus on the side. It's the rabbit eye chase. But this is what we're trying to stop. So. With that, Doug, you need a banana? <laughs> Are there any questions?